which is Iconic Stocks. And uh, today we have got uh, uh, very distinguished speakers and distinguished panelists. And uh, so my name is Jagadish, and I'm a distinguished professor of physics at the Australian National University and also serving as the editor in chief of the Applied Physics Reviews. And it's really my pleasure and honor for me to really moderate this particular session. So as you know that uh, Icon, uh, Iconix has got uh, every Friday uh, you know, talks and then you can see that uh, today is uh, second uh, uh, Friday of the August and then for today's speaker is Professor Terry Odom. And then also you can see other speakers on uh, the other days of uh, Fridays of August. And uh, you can see that I hope you'll join us uh, on all every Friday and then be able to listen to these experts and uh, speaking about and sharing their experiences and then speaking about the recent developments in those particular fields. So today is, of course, we got Professor Terry Odom, who is the, our uh, speaker and then a star speaker today. And then also we've got the panelists, uh, Professor Song Heishia, and then also Professor Martin Tho, and then also uh, Mr. Lee Yahui, our challenger. So really, it's a really exciting time. And then after the talk, and we're going to have the panel discussion. And today's speaker, as I mentioned, is an outstanding uh, leader of the field of nanotechnology and nanomaterials and an absolute star in the field of uh, designing nanomaterials and studying their properties, including uh, metal nanoparticles and plasmonics or so. So she is currently serving as the professor of uh, Charles and Emma Morrison uh, professor and uh, of chemistry and chair of the chemistry department at the Northwestern University. And as I mentioned that she has made really pioneering contributions and then based on her pioneering contributions to the field of nanotechnology and nanomaterials and plasmonics, she has received many, many awards and I can spend half of the time of this talk only telling about all the awards which she has received. And then I know that she wants to have more time than me telling her about all the awards. She most recently has become the member of the American Academy of Arts and Science, which is a prestigious recognition. And also she has been a fellow of the MRS and ACS and Royal Society of Chemistry, APS and OSA. And she has won many awards from RSC, ACS, MRS, and you know, any, any professional society you can think of, and she won the award. So that really tells you that how really an outstanding leader and a star performer she has been in, the, in this area. She has also founded many journals and she has been the founding associate of the chemical science and then uh, executive editor of the ACS Photonics, founding executive editor of the ACS Photonics. And most recently, she has taken up as editor in chief of the Nano Letters. And then without further ado, and then I would like to suggest that she's going to really now talk about this uh, the designing of these plasmonic lattices and then uh, really, uh, you know, I mean, the sharing as most of our recent developments and excitements in this particular field. Could you please join me warmly welcoming Professor Odom to really give us give her a talk? Thank you very much. Terry, please. Great, thank you. And thank you for the introduction. I'm very excited to participate in this series. Um, actually, when I uh, was coming up with a title, I, I think I forgot or I didn't realize, or maybe it was subconscious that part of the, uh, the, the mission of uh, these IconX talks is to connect the world and the universe. So I've already connected it just by having the universe <laughs> in my title, which I didn't realize. But, but as I, um, I was thinking about some of the work that we've done and how it might connect to, to some topics that have actually come before, uh, I settled on, I settled on, on this. Um, but before I get started, I wanted to acknowledge the group. Uh, we're still not through the COVID pandemic, but this was in the middle of it. And I just wanted to thank them and to acknowledge to all students who might be listening to, to this talk that we appreciate you so much. It's not been easy uh, to go through this virtual time. We've made new virtual connections, but just, um, you know, thank you. <laughs> so I, I wanna highlight some work from some star uh, students and, and postdocs of mine, Jing Chen Hu, Shikai Dang, Jung Yun Park and, and Jun Guan, and I will point them out as, as we go. So speaking of the expanding and, and universes, I wanted to go back and, and start uh, in a little bit big, big picture way related to um, our own solar system. And, and moreover, some ideas that I think are quite compelling and interesting related to 
what can nanoscale science and nanotechnology and nanophotonics uh, contribute to? So this is a perspective uh, article written by Harry Outwater and his uh, colleagues. And the idea is, can uh, a light sail uh, be designed that is uh, um, uh, transported through uh, radiation pressure from a laser to the nearest star in our, uh, in our, our galaxy, the Proxima Centauri? Uh, but what I liked about this is it's it's a it's a very hard um, engineering and, and science problem, but also brings together two areas that I think about quite a lot, which is materials. Um, what are the best materials designed for any application, as well as uh, photonics, and in particular nanophotonics. So the light sail needs to be as um, as lightweight as possible, but, but also robust. So what are the design principles for for something? like this. And so it provides some real motivation to start thinking about some of the fundamental science that we're working on and how then it can potentially be translated into these bigger, um, bigger problems. And so along these lines, there's been uh, major progress in the miniaturization of uh, coherent light sources, such as lasers. And I, you can see the, the timeline at the bottom down here, all mostly starting in the 1980s, about 15 years after the uh, discovery invention of the laser. And so you can see um, from a photonics perspective, there's the vertical cavity surface emitting laser to the sizes of the micro disks. So you know that sizes are still starting to be confined to um, the wavelength of light. Photonic crystals and, and metal based um, cavities and, and plasmon based lasers. But these are all fundamentals that is starting to be translated into really um, um, everyday applications, for example, within Vixel technology and, and facial recognition and smartphones and even all the way to you know, on-chip uh, atomic clocks. So there's a whole range of interesting uh, technology that has come out of, of the science in the design of small uh, coherent sources. And similarly for, uh, for optics, can we transform the normal way that we think about uh, manipulating light um, and, and focusing light, and even in, in large uh, Fresnel light lenses, such as uh, these uh, lighthouse, the ones that are often used in lighthouses. And how do we change that or transform that to uh, flat optics? And what has been uh, interesting is that you don't just get lighter materials. If you can do this, you'll notice that this is an example of um, uh, an analogy of uh, a Fresnel lens that can be uh, done on a flat surface is that there is now a discretization of the features. So instead of having just a gradient in phase based on the shape, now you have a, a, a discretization of the features that are contributing to those phase changes. And similarly, how we're familiar with the prism distributing or dispersing the light, this light can also be dispersed uh, on, a, on a flat surface by uh, these interesting uh, uh, pyramidal uh, type type shapes. So these are some interesting uh, design uh, that the community has uh, come up with to manipulate light uh, using uh, transforming something that is normally bulk to, to flat. So I want to start with these two particular applications for our plasmonic lattices, and then I'll uh, transition to some exciting applications based on uh, chemistry and, and catalysis. So when I've been thinking about how do we uh, reduce the sizes of optical devices. We're mostly focusing on, on plasmonics, so we're focusing on, on metals. Um, but I want to start out with the idea, it's not just about making something smaller, faster, better. It's not just about miniaturization uh, for us because we're interested in the new fundamental science. Because if we understand the science, <laughs> then you can start dreaming and thinking about things like making um, light sails. So, as I mentioned, we're talking about metals or, or plasmons. This is an example of a, a small metal sphere interacting with a, a plane wave of light. And you can see that the fields uh, are, uh, or actually this is the charge, it's oscillating uh, uh, collectively around the center of mass of the particle. And so, but, but you can see here is that the fields are, are very tightly localized to the particle surface. And so these uh, particles can be used uh, all the way to create um, these uh, beautiful uh, demonstrations of art. This is the rose window in the Cathedral uh, of Notre Dame where these co brilliant colors are from tiny pieces of, of metal, different uh, 
sizes and shapes uh, of metal nanoparticles, giving you these different colors, to real changes and how we might think about the, the applications. And so that's what I wanna talk about today is how can these small particles be used in designs for periodic flat optics? How do they offer new ways to manipulate light and new mechanisms? And how can we take advantage of, of these uh, uh, properties to be able to do things that traditional optics or even traditional photonics cannot do? And so part of the goal and the key is to take advantage of the intrinsic uh, properties of the plasmonic uh, response. So we have focused on the, this platform of plasmonic uh, nanoparticle lattices, partly because um, we, well, maybe because our, my training originally was in, in chemistry. And so you'd like to build things up atom by atom or unit by unit. And so along these lines, these uh, particle arrays can be thought about as two-dimensional uh, materials where the, the each of these uh, units can have the analog of being an atom and that if you can put them together in a certain type of symmetry and then you make them with a certain type of shape which can be connected to atomic valency, then new types of materials and also new types of properties can, can result. So this is just an example of uh, you can change the, the lattice geometry from something that's a uh, very symmetric two-dimensional square lattice, hexagonal. There are these uh, super lattices that can be uh, that can be uh, thought about and, and fabricated. There's a, a honeycomb lattice, there's kagame lattices. There's just a, a large range of lattice geometries. And then similarly to shape, you can have very symmetric shapes um, like uh, spheres or circles and these uh, diamond-like shapes. And then the material space is also quite large. And the materials uh, composition will mostly affect the wavelength range that they will operate. So there's a big design space depending upon what um, uh, fundamentals and applications that we'd like to go after. So this cartoon on the left summarizes some of the uh, immediate applications we have thought about. For example, in the use of these, uh, these particle arrays and the use of uh, lasing applications or in the use of lensing. And that's what I'll focus on uh, primarily today. But then there are other ways to use these particle arrays to mediate strong coupling and interesting types of uh, solid state uh, molecular emitters, as well as the ability to interact with two dimensional materials and affect uh, single photon emission from hexagonal boron nitride. So just by having this large platform, it ex expands, <laughs> if you will, the, the universe and the possibilities of um, what these lattices can um, be used for. Okay, so let's talk about the fundamentals uh, first. So as I mentioned earlier, these individual particles support localized surface plasmons. This is a dipole excitation. The fields are tightly localized to the particle surface. If we take these particles and space them on a photonic spacing, it's a hundreds uh, of nanometers, and we couple it to a diffractive mode, you'll notice that all of these uh, particles have the same phase. You can see this here. And the, the fields still are tightly localized to the particle with the major difference that these fields um, within the lattice are now uh, two orders of magnitude higher than on a single particle. So this collective effect makes a big difference in terms of local field enhancement. And so these types of uh, collective modes where we're coupling uh, the plasmonic effect because that's the unit to, to the diffraction as spacing, these are often called uh, lattice plasmons or surface lattice resonances. And so they take advantage of the properties of, of what we like best for these types of systems, meaning they take advantage of the photonic effect based on the diffractive spacing. So the resonances are very high quality, very narrow, um, but they also take advantage of the plasmonic effect with their high local field enhancements. And so this is what a uh, fabricated sample looks like that supports these um, surface lattice resonances or SLRs. These are typical design parameters for lattices that are in the visible region. This is a, an example of a, an area, typical area that we fabricate. It's about a centimeter squared. And this is a scanning electron micrograph. So you can see the particles are fairly uniform. But what I, what I really like about this type of architecture is that you get two different types of plasma modes all in the same sample. So you, these are these very narrow uh, SLRs that I introduced earlier, but uh, because they're built out of the collective excitation interaction of these individual particles, you still support the individual resonance uh, 
as well. So you have both excitations in a single, um, uh, you can access both excitations in a single substrate. And you can see that as you change the refractive index environment around the, for, uh, for these uh, particles that the, the wavelengths will also shift to longer wavelengths as the refractive index increases. So this is a normal incident um, spectra um, that corresponds to the theta equals zero, but you can stitch all of these spectra together to form these uh, equivalent of these optical band structures. And you can see that the experiment is in excellent agreement with the, the simulation. These dashed lines just indicate the pure photonic modes. These other ones are the uh, SLRs. And so again, if we look at the calculations uh, at this uh, band edge, which is the gamma point at the uh, k parallel equals zero or theta equals zero, you'll see again that these fields are highly localized and you have a, a standing wave. Okay, so how do we uh, make these types of uh, structures even um, um, better, if you will? Well, let me uh, at least review just a little bit of how we, we make them. So as I mentioned, we have a large area scalable process. So we typically um, fabricate centimeter squared or larger areas of these lattices. And the key to this is the deposition through a, a whole array. And so this can be made out of copper or, or gold. They can be put on flexible or, or rigid substrates. So these whole arrays act like a physical deposition mask. We can deposit any metal and then we can remove the metal deposition mask either through scotch tape or through some uh, orthogonal chemical edge. Um, and so what we'd like to do is a very lar uh, uh, parallel process, but we'd like to improve the quality of the individual particles. So the idea is that we would put them into uh, a furnace and thermally anneal them. So we could potentially take this shape um, as fabricated through the whole array lattice and make them more uniform. So these as fabricated lattices, they're pretty good. I showed you that they're mostly uniform in shape, but if you zoom in a lot there, they can be fairly uh, non-uniform and um, they're not completely cylindrical, but if we uh, anneal them at a particular time temperature uh, relationship, you'll notice that they become uh, very uniform and dome-like. These beautiful SCM images now of these particles that are nearly identical. And if we look in the transmission electron microscope on, on what they look like, you can see these are these as fabricated uh, particles. They're not uh, all that uniform in shape. They're fairly, fairly lumpy in this the fast Fourier uh, transform. But then after uh, annealing, you'll see that they don't become single crystalline, but they approach that. And so there are these very large grains that are single crystalline within these annealed nanoparticles. And I love this image here. This is where the, the substrate was, and we just, uh, scraped it all off and this is what this beautiful dome shape looks like. So how do these shape effects uh, uh, influence the properties of the SLRs? Um, well, you could see here in the, the spectra that it's pretty uh, significant. And in fact, that the, uh, the narrowness of the full width path back starts to approach that of the theoretical limit. So um, these are some nanoparticle lattices. It shows a surface lattice resonance. The full width half max is not very uh, impressive, but after annealing, you can see that it, it narrows up to about four nanometers. And after one month, it's still four nanometers. We tested this with silver. Uh, in the silver case, the uh, full width half max was already pretty near around seven nanometers. But after uh, one month, it's still around four to five nanometers without any additional uh, treatment for uh, to protect against the oxide that inevitably will, inevitably will form with the silver. And then finally with the aluminum, you can see that uh, again, this uh, resonance uh, narrows up uh, considerably and it's stable for many months uh, at a time. And so then we are interested in another plasmonic uh, material, copper. You can see by the Judah parameters, it's very similar to, uh, to gold in terms of, of the wavelength and the damping rate. But we also liked copper because it's also a catalytic material. So we wanted to take advantage of both the plasmonic effects, but also potentially make these lattices more functional. Um, the challenge of copper, however, is that the surface oxidation effects are severe. And so you can see this for the localized surface plasma um, that as the uh, as a function of short amounts of time, the, the plasmon effect is, uh, is severely compromised. But there's, uh, because uh, copper is uh, catalytic for, for graphene, we could imagine 
that we could use the copper as a catalyst to grow graphene only on the particle surface and thus not only protect from uh, uh, oxidation, but also to create these really quite interesting functional materials. And so uh, we uh, put our substrates into a, a CBD uh, setup with synthetic conditions that were uh, inspired by uh, just normal graphene growth on copper foils. So we used methane as the carbon source and hydrogen as a reductant to remove any excess copper oxide. And the hydrogen also activates the surface bound carbon. And it also acts as an etchant to control the size and morphology of the graphene domains. We had to operate at a relatively high pressure so that um, because we're at these high temperatures so we don't evaporate all of the, all the copper. And this is what the uh, time temperature profile uh, looks like for this synthetic conditions. So these are how we start out with the copper nanoparticles and then we put them into uh, a CBD furnace. And then you can see that we, again, because of these high temperatures, these are reshaped, but the particles look really uh, uniform. If we evaluate them in the transmission electron micrograph, you can see that there's a few layer graphene around the particle surface and it's only on, on the top that was exposed. You see that this is the, the substrate here and there's no graphene that grew there. And moreover, if we look at the, um, the XPS, you'll see that all we maintain are these uh, copper peaks. The copper oxide uh, peaks would uh, occur around uh, this binding energy or this binding energy. You see a little bit after uh, a month just on the, on the as fabricated copper. So we have these really nice materials now that are a uh, uh, few layer graphene over the copper. So does that affect the, the optical properties? Well, you see here that the optical properties still look uh, quite nice with the graphene on, on the surface. The, uh, the uh, predicted calculated SLR is quite narrow. And then if we compare uh, with the uh, experiment, you'll see that uh, we've exceeded that. So the for experiment is even narrower than, uh, than these uh, finite difference time domain simulations and it's uh, two nanometers. And even after a month, it still remains very, very narrow. And so this is, a, I think, a really exciting direction uh, that we're continuing to pursue where we're able to not only achieve very narrow resonances, which are important for some applications, but to create multifunctional uh, materials. And I'll close the talk with an example of uh, taking advantage of some of these effects. But what I'd like to do is transition to, now that we understand some of the fundamentals of improving these materials growth, uh, how does that affect some of the, the lasing uh, responses and this idea of miniaturization, but also um, thinking about these flat systems. So I'll be talking about uh, this particular application, but I want to acknowledge the, uh, the depth and the breadth of the uh, design architectures for plasmonic based uh, lasers. And I also just wanted to um, remember Mark Stockman who passed uh, away last November uh, for his pioneering ideas related to uh, uh, Spazer and these types of architectures that he envisioned that uh, where we could, where the community could see these um, uh, stimulated emission of, uh, of uh, surface plasmons. So in terms of these lattice plasmon uh, lasers, this is the architecture um, that we have uh, started with. So it's a sandwich type structure. We're dissolving a molecular dye as our liquid gain. Maybe this can be a solid matrix or, or, or a solvent. You pump the dye molecules and then they're transferring their energy to, to the plasmons. So for example, this is the SLR. This is what the lattice mode looks like. It's at this particular wavelength. Um, as long as the lattice mode overlaps with the photoluminescence bandwidth of the gain, uh, you will achieve lasing exactly at that wavelength. So for example, if the lattice mode were at uh, 880 nanometers, uh, which is still within this gain bandwidth, then you would uh, achieve uh, a lasing at that wavelength. So it's completely tunable within these um, regions. So there are some characteristics about the system that I think are really important in the design. It's a single mode uh, emission. That's how it's been designed. There's a high local optic, optical density of states at the, the gamma point uh, that I showed you introduced earlier. The line width is, is quite uh, narrow. There's a clear threshold um, with a nonlinear increase in intensity. 
the beam divergence is, is quite low. So it's, uh, so it's coming out normal to, to the surface and it's not diverging very much. But one of the most interesting uh, characteristics of this, these plasma nanolasers is the deep subwavelength mechanism. So this is a stimulated emission map uh, formed by solving the rate equations coupled to the uh, quantum effects of the, of the dye. And you can see that uh, in the stimulated emission rate term, the only population of dye molecules that are contributing to the lasing are tightly localized and confined to the particle surface. So you can have, we, we do have in fact dye molecules everywhere else uh, because it's in this type of uh, design as you can see in the cartoon, but it's only those that are localized to the around the particle surface that contribute to the lasing response, which is pretty unique. It actually will uh, give us some interesting uh, characteristics uh, soon. Okay, so how does this affect uh, lasing in these uh, copper uh, nanoparticles that have been overcoated with uh, graphene? So we tested for this uh, same uh, system using very similar uh, dye gain concentrations. And again, this is what the nanoparticle uh, lattices look like. In this case, we start off with a very narrow uh, cavity mode resonance to uh, nanometers. And then we achieve uh, lasing, which is low with line widths less than 0.2 nanometers. So I should mention that these, um, I, I actually expect the, the lasing line widths to be narrower than this. Um, we're just at the, the limit of our, of our spectrometer and we also have an optimized for, for temperature. So to even achieve this as a numerical metric, I think is pretty exciting. And again, there's very little uh, beam divergence. Okay, so that, this is the ability to change the, um, some of the, the, the lattice. And then, but we can also use uh, other ways to manipulate some of the lasing characteristics that, that we're interested in. So for example, we can have lattices on a flexible substrate and stretchable substrate, such as polydimethylsiloxane, PDMS. And if we uh, strain the, the substrate, then we increase the spacing between the particles and you can systematically uh, redshift the, uh, the lasing wavelength. And this is reversible because you can stretch it and then uh, release it. And this is pretty exciting because if the dye is uh, solubilized in, in liquid gain, even as you're stretching the, the substrate, there's always dye available, gain available in the hotspot regions of the, the particle. Um, also, uh, we are able to change the, the, the symmetry of the lattice as well as the shape of these uh, particles to achieve uh, dual mode lasing that depends on polarization, and I'll explain that more in just a minute. But also we're able to control the emission uh, from these lattices if we create super lattices now, uh, lattices of lattices. And so we have the same fundamental lattice spacing, but now we just organize them into these larger patches. And then you can see all, all uh, different uh, emission at different wavelengths. And we can also control the angle at which the light uh, comes out. But I wanna focus on the uh, polarization dependent lasing because I think this points to some very interesting fundamentals of how, um, how the fields can interact with certain populations uh, of molecules in some unexpected way. So this is the lattice geometry um, of uh, aluminum nanoparticles. It has this rhombohedral like lattice and based on our fabrication techniques, we can control the angle between the lattice vectors. This one in this case is uh, 67 degrees. If we're looking at the normal incidence zero order transmission spectra, the red is the measure, the black is the calculated. There are two uh, wavelengths that are produced. Uh, this is uh, this lambda one is produced from higher order uh, SLRs, and this uh, lambda two is from the first order SLR. And if we look at the, the phase maps, you can see that they show standing wave patterns according to the, the Bragg directions. So you can see that um, for lambda one, we changed the, the, the basis, if you will. So it's, uh, so the shorter wavelength, you can see it here, it looks like a standing wave pattern. And then at lambda two, the standing wave pattern is along this direction. 
Uh, but what's quite interesting is if we look at the uh, E squared, which is or the field enhancements at these different wavelengths, you'll see that for lambda one, which is at the shorter wavelengths, the hot spots are right around the, the, the shorter axis. But also for lambda two, the fields are highest at this shorter axis. So this is not true for these uh, circular cro cross-sectional particles, but it is true for these rhombohedral diamond-shaped particles, which I think is quite interesting. So the fields are highest at these, you know, the standing wave patterns are different but the fields are, are highest at these particular uh, regions, even though they occur at different wavelengths. So this will have some um, bearing on the, the lasing response and the mechanism. So if we combine the aluminum nanoparticle lattice with the C481 dye, this is the photoluminescence, as you can see here, uh, we're able to achieve lasing, um, at uh, two different wavelengths from the same sample. So this is not bad. This is about the, the, the limit of the gain uh, bandwidth. If we look at the light light curves, we'll see that the thresholds are about, uh, about the same. But if we were trying to understand which population of molecules is contributing to this, it's quite, it's, uh, quite exciting. And it's easiest to see in the simulated spectrum. So for example, if the, the polarization is, uh, is along this direction. You can see this here by these uh, arrows. We will only interact with the population of molecules at this particular wavelength and at this lambda one. And so you only see a single lasing peak. If you're at an intermediate polarization, so you can see uh, what that looks like here, you have partial population that can contribute to the lasing signal at short wavelengths and partial population that can contribute to the lasing signal at longer wavelengths. And then finally, if you're at uh, this particular angle, this is like 56 degrees, um, you'll notice again, you'll, all the hot spots, um, this actually, this is the stimulated emission map. So only the molecules that are here in the stimulated emission map is contributing to this lambda two. So this is pretty interesting because you have molecules, different molecules within these same hot spots that are interacting with either the uh, one of these SLRs or the other SLR to produce lasing at uh, either of these wavelengths. This is a really interesting mechanistically, and I think there's a lot of exciting um, outcomes that can come from this. So in terms of extending the, uh, these lattice designs uh, for multimodal or even multicolor trending toward white light lasing, we can stack these lattices together. And so this is a, a sandwich-like structure of, of two different lattices. And if we design them um, in a judicious way, then it's possible that we could have these overlapped colors that would be uh, additive for white light. And so we designed these aluminum uh, nanoparticle lattices. We designed just uh, two of them. One has a 450 nanometer spacing, one has a 350 nanometer spacing. And so this one is similar to what I just introduced. You have a shorter wavelength uh, resonance or a more fundamental SLR, and then you have these higher order SLR modes. And then if you uh, decrease the lattice spacing from 450 to 350, then this decreases this uh, fundamental, red, blue shifts this fundamental to shorter wavelengths as expected. So then we can combine each of these lattice modes with different dye molecules. So for example, if we could, uh, combined uh, this 450 nanometer lattice with this 20 millimoles of C480, you get uh, lasing at short wavelengths. If we can combine this 350 nanometer lattice with 50 millimoles of C500, you have this uh, green lasing emission. And if we combine uh, this 450 nanometer lattice with uh, three millimole of the DCM dye, you have this longer wavelength glazing. And so we can start thinking about these designs in terms of building this up one by one. And so it turns out that if we uh, mix these dyes together, we can not only get different colors out, but we control the relative glazing intensities by controlling the ratios of these dye molecules. And so uh, so we chose these concentrations such that we can, um, because there's different losses that need to be overcome at the different SLRs. Uh, these are empirically determined. So we combined uh, some DCM into the C480. 
we now pump this uh, solution. And you can see that depending on the, the volume ratios of these different uh, dye gains, then uh, you'll have higher intensity at longer wavelengths, or you could have higher intensity at shorter wavelengths or anything uh, in between. And then the lasing that comes out is, is overlapped um, right here in this position. Um, so, so similarly, this is from this is from a single substrate. Uh, but if we decide to now make this sandwich-like structure, uh, we first want to characterize the, the properties and see the effects of incommensurability on these uh, potential uh, twist angles. So these are these again longer uh, wavelength, a shorter wavelength than DMSO. If we look at the normal incidence, zero order transmission at any of these uh, in plane. Uh, angles or rotation, you can see that for unpolarized light, they all remain the, the same. So this looks uh, quite nice. And if we uh, evaluate the uh, optical dispersion diagram, you can see clearly here at K parallel equals zero, these uh, gamma point modes that, that are highlighted. So now we have the option of these three different types of uh, dyes to combine in uh, different ways. And just to focus on the two color lasing in the beginning, we can either combine DCM with the 500 or we combine the C480 with the C500. So if we combine uh, the DCM with the C500, you can see at the 10 to three or the 10 to 0.5, you can control uh, the, the ratios of this longer wavelength and shorter wavelength and this, this orange color that uh, emerges. And similarly, if we now combine uh, the C480 with the C500, and again, you can control the volume ratios and everything is now shifted to, to shorter wavelengths and we have this sort of light green uh, emission, light green blue emission. And then finally, we can combine all three uh, dyes together. Um, these, this is the CIE uh, color plot. All of these points are, are data that uh, we've uh, collected uh, and uh, so we're interested in, um, in this particular um, characteristics. And we've uh, empirically found that if we have the volume ratios of three, two, and 10, based on the concentrations that I showed you earlier, then this integrated together can uh, produce uh, white light. And so this is a sort of an exciting uh, idea that takes advantage of different, uh, a very simple uh, design but it extends what the possibilities are with these types of, of lattices and it's a direct outcome of having large areas. So we can stack them, we can twist them in, in different ways and we can control the types of emission that we'd uh, like to get out. And, uh, and so if we had these very tiny areas uh, made by other fabrication uh, approaches, there's just, there's some limits on, on the opportunities. So I sort of like this as a, as a nice application of uh, these large areas that we can fabricate. So all of those examples that I showed you are with liquid uh, gain, but also pushing some of the uh, obvious capabilities of in, in lasing applications. And so now I want to transition to not liquid gain, but, but solid state gain and focus on some characteristics of, of lasers that are more relevant towards applications. So for example, there's uh, demands to be able to control the polarization and uh, emission direction in, in lasers for a wide range of photonic technologies. From a fundamental perspective, uh, we are interested in shaping light and, and three aspects of that, both the polarization, as well as the phase, as well as the intensity. And two examples of some outcome applications related to facial recognition that I introduced earlier, also virtual reality, uh, also some applications in, in LIDAR, but also my, just microscopy, lithographic applications, optical trap, trapping, quantum and encryption. All of these types of applications um, rely on compact light sources, partly because the devices need to be uh, integrated. And so in terms of making things more uh, compact uh, and also more uh, long lasting, actually the dye molecules last for, uh, for a while, but if you're trying to integrate that into some other conventional uh, electronics, that's more difficult. 
And so we were interested in, in thinking about more uh, compact solid state designs. So the first uh, design that we uh, considered were using up conversion nanoparticle, these are these electronic tra transitions and these glass beads to be able to uh, couple them to, to the lattices <clears throat> where you pump at longer wavelengths and you achieve emission at, at shorter wavelengths. So this is the cartoon and this is what the SEM uh, looks like. And you can see by the, the Jablonski and energy diagram that it's much more complicated. So in this case, we have an erbium uh, sensitizer, sorry, a ytterbium sensitizer and an erbium uh, emitter. And there are multiple pathways that are possible for uh, electrons in excited states to, to decay. And so we would like to be able to shut off all of these uh, unwanted processes and focus on some of these specific transitions within these manifolds. And, and the approach that the community has pursued along these lines is really to just put a, a shell around these, um, around these uh, core particles uh, to, reduce, uh, phone, for, uh, to reduce phonon losses. And so that has produced, that has been uh, actually really important in the design of these upconversion nanoparticles for uh, uh, integrating with other materials. And then again, this is the energy transfer that we want for the, the plasmonic lattices. So what we'd like to achieve is a uh, single mode up converting lasing uh, because there are multiple uh, emission bands from these lanthanide uh, emitters, as you can see. And as I introduced, we have these high local optical energy of states wherever these SLR modes are um, designed. And then we'd also like to be able to see if we can enhance this uh, up converting uh, lasing process, which is a, a low power, low energy process. So if we compare the um, just the up conversion nanoparticles themselves, you see that there is a small power dependence um, and it's uh, the increase in the intensity of these uh, transitions uh, increases nonlinearly as you as we would expect. It's a little over a, a two photon emission on, on a log log plot before it starts to saturate. But now when we integrate these uh, nanoparticle, uh, upconversion nanoparticles, they're about 100 nanometers thick on our uh, silver nanoparticle lattices, we're able to achieve single mode upconverting lasing using a, a continuous wave pump. Everything else was a uh, pulsed pump and we have continuous wave emission. The continuous, continuous wave emission is an outcome from the, the long wavelength, uh, uh, sorry, the long time scale emission from the upconversion nanoparticles. But you can see here in these uh, power dependent studies, there's a significant uh, increase in the intensity. And then this is what the mechanism uh, looks like. There's a very strong nonlinearity. So this is low threshold. This is this two photon or two plus photon uh, process. And then uh, S increases uh, to this uh, fairly high value before it uh, starts leveling off because all of the emitters have been saturated at this point. But what I'd like to uh, just point out are these very low thresholds, the 70 watts per square centimeter, where uh, in this case, these types of uh, values are now two orders of magnitude lower than commercial laser diodes. So in this new type of architecture and design, we can now start to approach uh, commercial applications that, uh, that were not possible before. And so I sort of, I like this, it combines really interesting aspects of the plasmonics. You're taking advantage of that by dumping everything into a single mode, all the energy into a single mode, as well as these uh, up conversion uh, nanoparticle responses. So I think this is very exciting. Um, another solid state gain that has, uh, we needed to pay attention to were uh, quantum dots because they're in all sorts of displays uh, now, all of the technology has been uh, optimized. And so we uh, integrated them with these silver nanoparticle uh, lattices. You can see they form a, a thick or relatively thick 100 nanometer, 150 nanometer thick film. This is the transmission uh, electron micrograph and these are the, 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 the lattice. And because they, they form a, a film whose index is, is higher than the, that of the substrate, this will form some type of waveguide mode. And so now instead of a pure SLR, we have a waveguide SLR. And then depending upon the polarization, that will dictate uh, where the, the wavelength and the polarization of that, these hybrid modes are. 
So for example, if the photoluminescence is here, uh, this overlaps most strongly with this uh, WTM SLR mode. And so what's interesting about these particular uh, systems, now this is this hybrid mode, this WSLR mode that's uh, contributing to the optical feedback for, for this uh, system, is that this is what the um, light light curve looks like. So it has this very characteristic S shape based on the colloidal, semiconductor colloidal gain. But then if we look at the beam profile, uh, the measured beam profile looks very, very uh, unusual. It almost goes back to this, uh, it almost looks like the first pictures of the black hole going back to understanding our universe uh, better um, with the same asymmetry and in the intensities, but we solved the problem. It's not a, not a black hole, but it, uh, it's, uh, signatures that uh, we could understand after putting a linear polarizer in front of the detector that it's radially polarized. And so by changing the, uh, the orientation of the linear uh, polarizer, and you could see that where the uh, intensity of the beam follows that this particular um, lasing emission is radially polarized. It turns out that if you make the film uh, thinner, you change it from 200 nanometers to 150 nanometers, you're now coupling uh, an energy range to uh, the other type of SLR mode, the TE SLR mode. And as you might expect, because you're coupling to a different um, polarization state that you can control the polarization of the emission. And so instead of a radially polarized, in this case, you see that the the lasing emission is azimuthally polarized. So you can access either radially or azimuthally polarized light, and this is normal to, to the surface, simply by changing the thickness of the quantum dot film. And moreover, if we can not only can change the thickness of the film, but we can also control the direction. So everything that I mentioned earlier corresponds to a gamma point emission that's normal to the surface, but there are also these uh, high symmetry points. These are the high symmetry points uh, of a square lattice. And we can start to access all of these high symmetry points that also show a large optical density of states. And so we uh, took advantage of these by actually strained uh, quantum dots made by the Ted Sargent's group. And then we we're able to, to focus on uh, the emission at this uh, gamma point here, which is around uh, 19 degrees of free space. And so if we look at the, um, these different uh, uh, lasing spots that come out, you can see that there are these uh, four spots. Each of these uh, individually is going to be uh, azimuthally uh, polarized. You can see this here in this beam uh, profile. But now you can start to control um, not only the, the polarization, but also independently control the uh, angle at which it, at which it comes out. The system is also very quite quite nice. Is if you make the film thickness even higher, then besides achieving lasing at a high symmetry point, we can also achieve lasing at these uh, higher waveguide SLR modes. So almost any angle that we care to think about that overlaps with the gain. Okay, so I'd like to transition now to uh, besides some of these uh, lasing applications to the use of these uh, nanoparticle lattices and lensing. And so uh, mostly we're interested in how you can make reconfigurable lattices, meaning you don't want it just a fixed lattice, but you'd like to be able to manipulate the, the focal point and some of the imaging characteristics. So there was this uh, paper, that uh, beautiful paper that came out in 2016, where uh, you can see these different uh, units on, on PDMS. And by stretching the, the substrate, and uh, you could see that the um, the position of the uh, focal point will, will change. There are some disadvantages, however, of the system is that it lacks element-wise control, meaning you, you stretch it and the whole, um, the whole thing shifts, all of the spacing between the, the particles uh, shift. Uh, similarly, the, a different uh, strategy is to take advantage of phase change materials. So you can see here, this overcomes the element-wise control. So you have single, unit level tuning using this uh, laser writing uh, approach. But some of the challenges here is that it's uh, non-scalable and it's written in, in a serial way. You can see these two different focal points here. This one's 
this focal point here. And for this particular approach, it's limited to infrared materials just based on the, uh, sorry, infrared wavelengths just based on the materials that, that are being used. And so we were interested in this new concept based on uh, what we'll call uh, lattice lenses. We wanted to have a grid, uh, thinking about a, a grid of um, structures where the, the properties are given by the size of the, the, the lens as well as the transmission at each point in, in the array. So for example, if there, we considered a 10 by 10 micron lens, there are near infinite possibilities for, for focusing. So how do we open or shut or, or block or allow transmission from each of these uh, points on this lattice, which creates a huge design challenge. So the brute force uh, calculation is way more than the age uh, of the universe. And so this now calls for some advances that we, we and others have been thinking about related to genetic algorithms and machine learning. And the idea is then just to convert this to a binary problem. Because if you convert it to a binary, then all of these now, if you just follow the, the cursor, becomes a string. So you just have now this base, this DNA that is uh, 10, uh, over a thousand bases. And so uh, we developed this lattice evolutionary uh, algorithm where we start off with a certain member number population. We evaluate the, the fitness using either a point source or a finite difference time domain simulation. And then we uh, sort based on fitness. So the fitness is the requirement that you're trying to optimize for this uh, system. And for the first studies that we did, we were just interested in, in maximizing the intensity at the focal point. And we have to divide the distance from the maximum to the focal point to avoid um, <clears throat> uh, where we have uh, sing to avoid singularity effects. Okay, we then uh, mix and create the children population and then we check for convergence. So for very sim simple systems, um, this can be done in, for a single focal point within you know, half an hour. So that was for, for whole arrays, but then we're interested in these nanoparticle lattices because we like these uh, particles as building blocks for a couple of reasons. First is that, as I mentioned earlier, we can control the operating wavelength by controlling some of these localized plasmons. And then the response can be tuned by, by the arrangement. But the challenge with particles compared to holes is now we must use um, a solver to uh, consider all the materials properties of the particles. Um, and then we're taking advantage of the genetic algorithm. So it's an inverse design. So we're taking advantage of a universal black box design approach. And if we're focusing on a single focal point, we just only need a single objective <clears throat> sorry, to optimize. But if we want to do more things than, uh, than analytical expressions can give us, then we need to do multi-objective optimization. So we need a genetic algorithm as an <clears throat> efficient search heuristic for these discrete structures. And this is a scanning electron micrograph of what three different nanoparticles look like to give us three different imaging colors at three different wavelengths. Uh, but we want to demonstrate imaging with the, this uh, simpler system with these SLRs that I introduced earlier. So how can we take advantage of these strongly coupled nanocavities? And so we want to engineer the wavefront just by patterning the substrate. So for example, we have just the same uh, uh, silver nanoparticle uh, lattice, but instead we're, we're wanting element control around each of the individual particles. So this is where we take advantage of these collective properties. So for example, if there's a index match substrate over the, uh, the, the particle, all of the light will be scattered or effectively blocked. However, if the particle is in air, this is not an index match condition, the particle is not gonna trap and scatter the light in plane, so it's just gonna be transmitted. So it's a very nice way to be able to manipulate the lensing aspects or how often the light will be uh, scattered in plane here or transmitted. And so we can again take, starting with a, uh, a random uh, beginning, search through the configurations to achieve these uh, lattices. So uh, the first experiments uh, focus on patterning um, on silica using uh, PMMA. And so, as I mentioned earlier, the substrate index controls both the phase and the intensity around the individual particles. You can see this here. And so we're able to design lattices, and this is now experimental data 
This is uh, a lattice that will focus to a focal point of five microns. And this one focuses to a focal point of 10 microns. We can also achieve multifocal point uh, lattice lenses when we, by patterning the substrate. So for example, this is a, a two focal point uh, that can be achieved from this lattice and three focal points and all of them are in different vertical planes, which I think is pretty neat based on this type of um, uh, uh, patterns. You can also achieve, and these are three multi three objective optimizations. This is five objective optimization. You can see what the patterns of these uh, lattice lenses are to achieve image, uh, to achieve these uh, focal points in these different planes. And so this is where I think this digital uh, approach has some advantages over analytical approaches where the these solutions would be uh, prohibitive. And then we wanted to be able to scale them. This is a strength of our lab to be able to scale up uh, technologies in new types of um, creative ways. Take, again, taking advantage of these plasmon uh, effects. Uh, we take these, uh, we have a silicon uh, template. We mold off that and then we can use this PDMS, PDMS mask to uh, continue to uh, pattern these different types of lattices. And so using this uh, PDMS mask, we can make these SU8 uh, metal lenses that are identical to the silicon template. So this is how we can do this reconfiguration in, in parallel. We have four uh, foci lenses you can see here. This is a, a SAM image. This is what the optical micrograph looks like. We take our mask, we wet it with solvent, and we put it in contact with this image on the left. And then we, after the same process, then we achieve uh, three, three focal point lenses. We can take the same substrate, now, whoops, sorry, now put a different mask on here and then it goes back. So this is pretty neat. You have the same substrate and you're just remolding and remaking every time. And so you can see here, this is four focal points, three focal points, you say again, four focal points, use another mask, three focal points, and this can just be continued. So you're just redistributing the dielectric because it's a polymer and it can be swollen and dissolved. Uh, you're not removing anything, you're just redistributing it, which I think is pretty exciting. They may also demonstrate a simple uh, imaging uh, technique using these lenses. And so this is the, the object and this is the, the image. Um, and we're able to uh, achieve this with uh, multi-scale uh, imaging. And so this is what the image is from this uh, multi-scale object. We're also able to achieve um, uh, imaging in a single plane, but also imaging in, in multiple planes. And so again, we're just using this reconfigurable idea. We use SANE to take the same substrate, we mold it into the features that we want um, to get these types of images. And so you can see here from a single focal uh, lens, this is the image that you would expect. And then from a multi-focal point uh, lens, um, depending upon the planes will depend on the magnification. And so this is a first image, and then this is the same image, but just uh, larger. And then we can do this uh, in different types of ways. You can get, take the single focal point. We can do same with a different mask to get two focal points. And then this is the image uh, that is formed. And similarly, uh, four focal points, and this is the image that, that is formed. So there's many different uh, ways to just reconfigure the uh, the imaging properties just based on the single lattice patterning the dielectrics. Okay, so in the last uh, five minutes that, that I have, I want to just discuss some ideas related to uh, the expanded universe. So I, I, I told you how we can push the capabilities of uh, lasers and, and lenses or these types of ideas. And now we wanna focus on um, some areas in, in photocatalysis. And this goes back to the multifunctional piece that um, I've been excited about from the very beginning. So we're interested in these uh, copper platinum four shell nanoparticle lattices. We wanna use the copper as a plasmonic aspect and the platinum for catalytic properties. And platinum is a good catalyst for uh, hydrogen evolution reaction. And of course the copper lattices support strong near fields. So we'd like to take advantage of the light harvesting aspects of the plasmon and the catalytic aspects of the platinum. And so this is the synthetic strategy. We start off with these lattices and then we can grow um, by uh, deposition and diffusion uh, uh, shells of, of platinum. And this is the reduction process that occurs. 
the, the particles look, look pretty good. We start off with a fabricated sample, and then by the end, you can see that uh, in the, these uh, TEM images that this is the, the platinum, which is mostly on the outside, and we still have a, a copper core, and you can also see the contrast in the, in the TEM for the shell. Um, so we first tried to test these as just uh, photo catalysts, and then we found out that we just don't have high enough densities for our current uh, our current setup to be able to measure the hydrogen evolution. So we decided to uh, push the system a little bit more by making it um, uh, doing a photo electro catalyst. And so we put these particle arrays on ITO, which is indium tenoxide, which is uh, transparent, uh, but it's also conducting. And so then now we wanted to use uh, this type of substrate, but we needed to simulate the different types of modes that we could test. So we were testing an SLR mode, testing a uh, localized surface plasma mode, and this inner band transition. So each of these now occur at different wavelengths, as I sort of mentioned uh, earlier. The shapes are because uh, of this waveguide mode. So we tested this um, for white light in, in the beginning. Uh, and so you can see this is the, the plain copper, just the platinum by itself. And then when I have the, when we have the core shell uh, particles, and you can see that the catalytic activity for the copper nanoparticles, as well as the copper uh, core shell particles with platinum, they're intensity dependent. So yes, we take advantage of plasmonic uh, effects because the platinum is not plasmonic and doesn't have any light intensity effects. And, um, and we believe that the, uh, that the effects are much higher here. You can see based on the, the current densities uh, because of the, the plasmons. And then finally, we just wanted to compare the different modes. And so we compared the different wavelengths by just putting a fill, uh, selecting out the different, uh, using filters to select that different wavelengths where they're comparing the SLR, the LSP, or the inner band uh, transition. And so you can see that if we're just comparing um, we'll just look at this one, the copper at uh, platinum, there's a higher activity from, from the SLR, from these, uh, these, this red curve compared to the, the blue, which is the least, and then the, the, the localized plasma, which is sort of in between. And, and most of the reason for that is these uh, high, local, high local fields. Okay, so in summary, I introduced a new way to think about improving the quality just fundamentally uh, of the lattices, which also gives us greater uh, capabilities. Um, in, introduce some ideas of nanoscale lasing that produces very interesting technological uh, characteristics, uh, an idea for flat lenses that combines advances in genetic algorithms with just different ways to manipulate the phase on an element, uh, an element uh, style, a single element style, and then a platform for other light matter interactions in terms of photoelectric catalysis, but also there are many other things that we can imagine related to these confined uh, chemical reactions. And so this is the, the group as we finally, there's our first group picture uh, about maybe three or four weeks ago. Um, and everyone's very happy to at least see each other for the first time in, in 16 months. Um, so thank you for, for joining and I'll be happy to answer any questions um, and discussion with the panel. Uh, th thank you very much, Teddy, for that inspiring and exciting talk and then really covering a broad spectrum of topics of uh, nanoscale plasmodic lasers and uh, to flat lenses to photocatalysis. It's really, really, very stimulating. And I'm sure that uh, uh, our participants have really learned a lot from you and I'm quite excited about these developments in this particular field. And uh, of course, we typically get many questions. And what we do is that because of time limitations, and we try to restrict ourselves to three questions. And uh, so what I will do is that I will share this, uh, these slides. And uh, the first question is from, uh, uh, this, is, this is Shinghua from Xi'an. Professor Terry, thanks for your wonderful talk. The copper coated with graphene nanoparticle is very stable. It is amazing. The major reason is from interface or others. Does the dimension can be controlled very precisely? Yes. So I, I also think it's very amazing that they're as stable uh, as they are. Uh, I think the, the primary reason for that is because the graphing grows conformally. So you can see that in the transmission electron micrograph uh, images that the whatever the shape of the 
copper nanoparticle, the, the graphene is conformal. I think if the graphene were not conformal, it would be less stable. Uh, and in terms of whether we can control the graphene thickness, as I mentioned, it's just few layer. Um, I think there is some ways to, to do that. We just haven't, we haven't focused on that because mostly we were looking at it as a protection, as a protection layer. Um, in terms of the copper nanoparticle arrays, uh, whether the dimensions can be controlled, uh, yes. So say we start out with these large particles and then we want to make them much, much smaller. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's possible. Uh, you just have to control either by the starting materials or controlling the, the, the rates and the, uh, and the temperatures. So we didn't want all the copper to evaporate, which is why we were at the, the 900 degrees, but you can imagine elevating the, the temperature a little bit to create faster um, evaporation of the copper, but then you also need to make sure that the, the, uh, the reduction of the uh, methane is still uh, possible to form the, the carbon. But the other thing I should mention just briefly about this, I think it depends on the size of the particles. So the graphene grown on foils, they will have a, a, a finite area that they can be single crystal in. So I think if the particles were very, very large, um, it might not be as, as conformal, that interface. But because the particles are fairly small, they're on the order of 100, 150 nanometers, that's still enough for the graphene to be fairly conformal. Okay, thank you very much, Tari. And the next question is from Huyun Ye uh, from Guangdong University of Technology. What is the evidence of SLR generation? Does SLR wavelength deviate a lot from RA edge? Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, the, the, SL, the SLR or the surface lattice resonance is a hybrid mode. It's a hybridization of the localized surface plasmon from individual particles as well as uh, photonic mode or the Bragg mode, in-plane Bragg mode. So in terms of does the SLR wavelength deviate uh, a lot, I would say the blue edge corresponds pretty well with the Raleigh anomaly, it has to. It's the photonic, it's the photonic mode. And you can mostly estimate that by lambda, the, the spacing between the particles times the refractive index to first order. That's what that will, will okay. give you. Thank you. But just, but just as, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Please go ahead. Sorry. Oh, ju just as a reminder, the Raleigh anomaly is a pure photonic mode, but the SLR is, is a hybrid mode. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The last question is, this is uh, Chen from Chengdu. Nice talk, Professor Odom. Uh, how stable these dye lasers are and is, is heat generation an issue? What power she can get from these plasmonic dye lasers and up conversion lasers? So the, the dye lasers, it depends what you mean by stable. Uh, they can operate not forever, but for a long time. The reason for that is if they're, if they're in liquid. So if the dye is in a solid matrix, the devices will die in about 30 minutes. If the dye is solubilized in liquid, they last hours and hours and hours. And, and the reason for that is because you'll always have by Brownian motion molecules in the hot spot. So you don't get lasing from the same molecules, okay? But you get lasing from molecules that can make their way into the hotspots. That's what's very special about the, the dye laser uh, system. Um, the heating is only an issue uh, when we're related to uh, solid gain. So for example, in quantum dot lasers, <laughs> uh, we want to achieve continuous wave emission from these lasers. We've been working on that. Uh, we're still working on that. But there are challenges on getting enough energy into these dots. And uh, so then, yes, in that case, there are some heating issues. Uh, but we're trying to work on some design principles to overcome that, but it's, but it's not easy. But it, yes, so in that case, there are some heat generation. But there isn't heat generation if you're just thinking about absorption from the cavity because uh, the, the, the light excitation, these are optically pumped devices, is being absorbed by the, by the gain and then it's being transferred to the plasma. So you don't have to worry about heating from the particles themselves. Um, the power generation, this is a good question. Um, it's not that high. You know, you would say, oh, you 
pump in all of this energy and then how what is the powers that you get out it's it's not nearly what we would like yet we're working on that we're working on finding ways to lower the thresholds um, and also take advantage of new types of cavity modes to so that you increase just like in some advances in photonic crystals so that you can actually increase the power outputs but that's that's a, a uh, an area of current research right now good Okay, thank you very much Jerry, for that uh, great talk and um, uh, really giving such detailed answers to these questions. And uh, I may I request all of you to really please join me to thank Professor Perry Wardham for giving such an exciting and inspiring talk. And uh, so thank you very much again, once again. And then now let's move to the panel discussion. And uh, so we've got, uh, uh, see today the panelist is Professor Martin Tho from Iowa State University. He's an associate professor there. He's really an absolute expert uh, in the area of uh, soft materials and designing new materials. And uh, so he has also received many awards, including Mary Fraser Scholarship from Harvard, Fellowship from Harvard, Black and Beach uh, uh, Developing World of uh, uh, Dissemination Award, and ISU Research Excellence Award, and the Lynn Anderson Award. So quite quite a variety of awards he has received. And uh, so he's an absolutely rising star. And uh, welcome, Martin, and then great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. And uh, then, of course, uh, I don't have to introduce our host and uh, founder of the Iconex Talks and uh, Professor Tsong Heisha, or, uh, Alice, we call her lovingly Alice, and uh, everybody knows Alice, and uh, Alice from Beijing, and that's how everybody knows her uh, internationally. And she's the one who really started this Iconex Talks, and then she's a professor at uh, uh, Peking University, and uh, she has, uh, her interests are in the MEMS area, and then she has made pioneering contributions to MEMS, and great to have her here with us as well. And then our challenger, and then challenger is uh, Mr. Li Piaohi from Shanghai Jiaotong University, and he is a PhD candidate in the uh, School of uh, Electronic Information and Electrical Engineering, and then he did master's degree from Harbin Institute of Technology, and he has won outstanding graduate award from Harbin Institute of Technology, and then great to have our challenger here with us. I want to thank, first of all, all the panelists for joining us this evening. And uh, so generally in these uh, panel discussions, we give the opportunity to our challenger first because challengers are the future leaders and it's important to really give them the opportunity to really interact with the speaker. And uh, maybe Lee, Lee Yahui, uh, could you please uh, go ahead and ask any questions you may have to Professor Odom, please? Professor Odom, thank you for your wonderful talk. And uh, Mm, I'm Yang Hui from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. How can machine learning use the use the use the to predict the properties of the super lattice structures? Uh, the the super lattice is related to the the arrays of arrays, that structure, or 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 just general in the imaging, the lenses. Which 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 is more interesting to you? I think it's a general, yeah. Yep. Oh, general question, okay. Yep. So, so the reason that we, um, so we like to use the tools that make the most sense for any application. So for things that we can um, predict the, the properties of uh, just using a general solver, we'll, we'll do that. You can solve Maxwell's equations and fre frequency domain, time domain, whatever makes the most sense for that particular application. The reason why we were interested in uh, a genetic algorithm is because we wanted to do more in the lensing applications than what is possible analytically. So if you solve the, uh, the equations for where should the focal point be, if you have this type of index and you have this different size, um, it's easy for a single focal point that's just you know, their Fresnel lens type design. But if you wanted to start doing designing substrates related to, uh, can you uh, focus light in three focal, three focal planes? Can you, in, in different X, Y, Z directions? That's not so straightforward. Uh, and so we wanted to do things using uh, a digital approach or the genetic algorithm approach that we could not do using a simple analytical approach. That's the only reason that we, we did that. Um, and I should mention that genetic algorithms are difficult for plasmonics 
because you have to use uh, finite difference time domain simulations to, mod to, to model the, the structures. Genetic algorithms are much easier for photonic devices that are mostly made out of dielectric. And so then you get very interesting weirdo structures, you know, for a certain type of physical outcome. If you want uh, light emission in a certain wavelength or a certain polarization uh, or, or a certain propagation direction, then, then there's these very interesting uh, structures that, that result based on that type of optimization. But for plasmonics, it's really difficult. That's why it's not been done much. Thanks for your great answers, Professor Odom. So, Lee, do you have Lee Yahui? Do you have any further questions or? Uh... Uh, yes, yes. And uh, how can we realize its imaging uses of these super lattices? Oh, super lattices. Mm. Well, I, I personally like super lattices. I like the lattices of lattices partly because they, they really show that you can extend concepts from the atomic world. So it's not easy to make uh, atomic super lattices, but you, we've seen uh, amazing uh, benefits all the way from topology to, to magnetism to, um, to just you know, general optical and electronic effects. And so the, to, to be able to mimic that uh, in, uh, in photonics form, uh, I think is is quite exciting. And actually I should say plasmonics form because the photonics doesn't have that much of an equivalent. And the reason for this is you have these lattice, these, these patches of particles and they're interacting over 20 microns, 100 microns effectively in, in free space because they're all surrounded by the same dielectric environment. So why is it that there's so much coherence uh, in the system that they can interact both uh, in plane. And as we're learning now, and we're just working through some really interesting things all, all the way in, in the Z plane, uh, maintain that coherence. So the dielectric structures don't, don't do that. You need the scattering properties of the, the plasmons to actually help that out. And this is sort of new for us, but if you think about arrays of arrays of particles in sort of free space and the coherence and, and phase, that you can maintain over macroscale distances. It's quite surprising. But, um, but I think it's also very inspiring because it goes back to these fundamentals on the properties of the, the building unit. Okay. Well, thanks for your great, Th uh, great answer again, Professor Odom. <laughs> okay, Th thank, thank you, uh, Yahui, and then also thank you, Terry. And maybe we'll come back to you as a challenger to the last question that made me think about what question you want to ask. You don't have to ask technical questions. You can also ask uh, career questions as well. And uh, so feel free to ask any questions you may have about your future career or anything of that sort as well. So you don't have to always feel, you only have to ask questions related to Professor Odom's talk, okay? Okay, now let's go to our uh, panelist, uh, Professor Martin Tho. Uh, Martin, do you have any questions uh, do you want to raise? Yeah, uh, uh, Professor Rom, very nice talk, very, very interesting. And uh, I wanted to ask a career-related question because of the students and postdocs and uh, uh, people who are aspiring to join this field. Uh, you, 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 you've, you have brought together nanoscience and plasmonics, but what also was captured in your talk is the role of surface science in all of this. So for somebody who is aspiring to, to join this field, that is so interdisciplinary, what would your advice be to them as they prepare to uh, get, maybe emulate you, be mentored by you, or get into the field in general? How, what would you advise them to do? Thank you for that question. I, I mean, I think in, in my own lab, it, it happens, well, it happens organically, but it happens by design. So I'm in the chemistry department uh, and I have students from material science and applied physics and biological sciences. So that means <clears throat> when they go to group meeting, <laughs> they need to learn about, or at least have a broad appreciation for all of these areas, even if it's not in their PhD training area. And so what I recommend for, for students that are interested in multidisciplinary research is to, first of all, 
go to as many talks as you possibly can in different areas because you're exposed to very different uh, ideas uh, at, these, at these talks. But also you need to be able to learn a common language. So how someone, uh, a physicist will explain things, it's not the same thing as a chemist, it's not the same thing as a biologist, and it's certainly not the same thing as an electrical engineer, even if you're talking about something as simple as ion mm -hmm. or current, it's just not the same. And so how does that, how do you, can you develop a common language that intersects all of these different disciplines? That's, that's hard work, but it has yeah. to be done, uh, it has to be done. And I think that the, the last is, is realizing that you know, you're not gonna, there, you'll, it's a rare circumstance that you'll be prepared for a multidisciplinary research, rare. I mean, you, you, you have a PhD in something very specific. And so <clears throat> if you really wanna make a mark along, along these lines, you have to be willing to continue to work hard outside of your formal training, right? Outside of the classes that you typically take, outside of maybe what is even required for your, uh, for your group. And um, yeah, it takes, it takes some work and you have to sort of like it. <laughs> but I would say all of those things are, 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 are quite important for multidisciplinary research. Oh, and then one, one last thing I, I should mention because I just thought about this is um, you have to know who you're talking to. So, so say I'm intersecting surface science and lasers. Um, will the laser people care that I've done something on the surface? Not really, unless it produces a big advance in, in the technology or a, a big advance in some characteristic. So then I would focus on that. But if I'm talking to chemists that might care about the surface science, you know, then you focus more, it's the same science, but you focus more, the message has to be home so that the chemist will appreciate this interfacial engineering, what is locally happening at, at the surface. So that's important too, to be able to, speak the common language, but also to know who is going to appreciate what from the multidisciplinary research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Terry. Thank you, Martin. And uh, so maybe we'll come back to you if we have any time permitting, and then maybe we'll go to Alice. And Alice, do you have any questions for our panelists? Uh, yes, I do have some questions. I totally agree that Terry said the people in different areas need uh, you know, develop some common, you know, uh, language can get between. I think this uh, most important is, is the questions. What kind of question you want to be addressed? Yeah, if you get to the questions, then everyone, you know, can use their language to answer that. So uh, here, my question uh, for you is, uh, I really get some ideas from your sandwich structure. You remember that you have a sandwich structure? That's uh, uh, that's very interesting. I'm thinking, is that possible? You know, we, uh, MAMS person, or we all very familiar with the DMD. Yeah, the structure from PI we use for, you know, project and all these things is uh, like, you know, still, uh, the, the mirror, you know, with the tending some angles like this. I think if that possible in the future, we can use your super light lens, you know, Ethereum uh, between was uh, some liquid that they can tune in, you know, uh, they can tune in some angles. So this, you know, can be helpful to, you know, getting a uh, more precision or high resolution DMD related structures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is mm -hmm. that possible? So, so, yeah, so we've just introduced a very simple design and I think it, I'm very excited that it works. Right, that's the stacking of these different types of, of lattices. But we just, we just, you know, did it with very simple um, materials for proof of concept, really, for white light lasers is just for gain. But there are other liquid materials, you're right, that you can put in like liquid crystals or things that control polarization or things that have other types of properties that, um, that and, and also I think um, based on our work with IT as substrates, now we can start to electrically contact and control mm -hmm. some of these optical resonances. So I think it's a materials advance there that will also open up other potential for uh, manipulation in the way that you've described, but also maybe without having to use physical motion. Because if you can imagine having a, you know, a static structure, but that can be manipulated uh, either 
you know, changing an angle and plane or applying a, a, a bias voltage, that could be pretty exciting too, to be able to control the emission direction and manipulation of the light. Yeah, I think this also can, you know, solve the problem for like the, you know, the mirrors. We all, now mm -hmm. the size of mirrors is like- it's the physical. Of, yeah, as a physical mm -hmm. 10 or more, 10 more microns. So if we can use this super lens, these ideas that can be down to nanoscale. That's will be oh, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. a big step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it should be possible. Okay. Thank you very much. But I'm an optimist, but I'm an optimist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Alice, and thank you, Terry. And then maybe we'll go to our challenger again one more time. And then uh, Li Yahui, and do you have a question now? Do you have any question to our speaker? Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, I have I have another question. Uh, compared with the traditional nanoparticles, what's the characteristics of the plasmonic nanoparticles in the manufacturing process? Okay, so it depends on how they're made, of course. So. Metal nanoparticles in the beginning were made uh, in a colloidal synthesis, where you're taking a metal salt, you're reducing it uh, with some type of reductant. Uh, in general, if you have very small particles made by solution, they're single crystalline. That's just mostly how they're, they're, they're made. Um, you can control the shape by having a seed particle and then having it at higher temperatures, and then often, if they're small enough, then you also get single crystalline materials. It's very difficult to get large single crystalline materials in solution. But if we use a fabrication approach, like I just, uh, like I mentioned, uh, those will be larger. Uh, and it, but then it's more difficult to form these uh, single crystalline particles, but we can get there by thermal annealing. But the other thing that I think is quite interesting is we have started to combine uh, these fabricated particles with synthetic techniques. So I, I showed you an example, starting with copper and reducing platinum. But we can also, for example, have gold particles, and then we can control the surface roughness by using colloidal chemistry now to grow uh, different spiky features from, from the surface. So there are different ways to control the, the crystallinity and the shape and the composition by combining uh, chemistry methods or solution-based methods with engineering methods, these uh, fabrication or, or, or top-down approaches. Okay. I think it just expands the space of possibilities. Mm, thank you, Professor Odom. <laughs> okay, thank you, Terry. And uh, so maybe Martin, do you have any questions to uh, our speaker today? Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, uh, Professor Adam, you know, uh, I, I've been a big fan of your, your earlier work on soft lithography. Um, we've been doing uh, some of the work and uh, using the, the PDMS, hard PDMS to do molding. And, and, and looking at our career, again, coming back to our career, it, and uh, having been, uh, I think we, we both shared a mentor at different times, George, George Whiteside. Uh, and have, coming from a lab like that where you were doing very hands-on fabrication, how did you migrate all the way to plasmonics? <laughs> People <laughs> ask me this all the time, actually, because my, my PhD advisor is Charlie Lieber, mm -hmm. and we worked on scanning tunneling micros. My thesis was the electronic property, structure and electronic properties of single wall carbon nanotubes. So I started with scanning tunneling microscopy as well as single wall carbon nanotubes. That was my PhD thesis. Then you go to patterning with George, and then how do I get to nanophotonics and bio, et cetera? Uh, I just learned a lot. So I, I arrived in Northwestern in 2002, hired in, tw hired in 2000, arrived in 2002. And, and uh, I was interested in uh, analogous properties. So I think I have referred to it at the talk, atoms can do one thing, then what can photonics do as analogs? So I started based on these ideas, I was inspired by, I've always loved quantum, quantum things. So the, the quantum corral that Mike Cromie and Eigler had done, 
quintessential. So I was interested in the optical analog. Can we build a, a, an optical corral? So I started working on that in the beginning. We used near field scanning optical microscopy and, you know, see if we could see these effects. But then I, I realized that, you know, NSOM is too hard. <laughs> it's too hard for me. And so then we moved to other types of, of things. But, uh, but, but I like your, your, your question because I had advice from the beginning of one of my mentors, colleagues. He said, you know, I think it's really risky for you to be working on what you're doing. You don't have any formal training in this. Uh, no optics training, no X, Y, Z training. And I said, you're right, I don't. <laughs> but I, I'm willing to learn. And uh, and there's no no guarantee that if I do the safe things that I was trained in, that that will be meaningful or advanced science. And if I, if I were going to fail, I want to fail on my own terms. Mm-hmm. I want to try this and, and learn this. And if it doesn't work out, then that's okay. I mean... Mm-hmm. It's okay, it just doesn't work. But, and so that's sort of the, the progression. I had to learn a lot, uh, a lot, a lot. But at, at Northwestern, people like George Schatz, they help you learn a lot. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so that's how we made this big, this big <laughs> shift in, in the types of science that, that we work on. Yep. And, and the reason I'm asking that question is for the sake of the students who, you know, they might look at your profile and what you've done and uh, they, they might look at the, your pedigree and say, oh, Charles Lieber, George White says, you know, but they don't realize the least that you have to take and the, the boldness mm-hmm. that you have to have to step out of your comfort zone and get a little bit uncomfortable uh, and, and always be a student. Uh, getting a PhD doesn't yeah. mean that you stop being a student. And, and, and it's, it's always encouraging. I'm in the same platform too. So I've never done medals, but I'm in it now. So, so I understand what you're saying. <laughs> But, but this is true. This is what I tell people to always, or I recommend people to people to always stay a student. We always have to keep yeah. learning. Yeah, Terry, I like your answer. Yeah, it just uh, ran back to the I can X, right? Yes. Yeah, I can yep, do yep. everything X. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Andy, you, you already, you know, in your research, had the universe. Now your answer is run match this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Terry, and uh, thank you, our panelists. And uh, so it's been a great uh, panel. And then uh, I want to thank all of you for participating actively in this one. And uh, then, uh, Terry, if we would have been physically meeting with you, then we would have really presented you a plaque or something. But considering that these <laughs> things are now happening virtually, and we want to present to you this virtual plaque uh, uh, for uh, you know honoring you with this pre- presenting this excellent talk and participating in this ICANX talks and inspiring and then motivating lots of young people, those that are participating in this particular ICANX talk. So thank you very much. So with that, and, uh, so me. yeah, thank you. And again, uh, as I would like to point out that uh, next week we are going to have uh, the, you know, ICONX Young Scientist Award talks, and then here are the speakers and panelists, and then we'll have uh, uh, our we, three organizers, uh, Professor Alice Sang and uh, Paul Weiss and myself, and of course, uh, Professor Martin Thoe also is going to join us. And then two speakers are going to be, these two speakers, those are here. And then we are very much looking forward to seeing all of you uh, next Friday uh, to this uh, Iconex Young Scientist Award talks. And hope uh, you'll come and join us and enjoy these presentations and uh, see who is going to win these uh, awards. With that, and we want to thank all the people, those are really working behind the scenes to be able to help us with this, uh, bringing the Iconex talks together. And again, once again, we would like to take this opportunity to thank our you know, wonderful speaker uh, for giving such a stimulating and wonderful talk and also inspiring the younger generation of uh, how one need to really get into outside their boundaries and then keep learning. And the lifelong learning is an important part of life sort of thing. Thank you very much to all of you and have a good morning or good afternoon or good evening. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>